And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother into the temple. Some he is he may be he may be known in some circles as the as the person with questionable taste in common writer avatars. Well, at least for a few weeks. Or the or the per, or the person um for who is spearheading his own particular cider verse. We had him back. We had him here about a year ago. Now he, now he's back. Now he's back. Please welcome Thomas Burpee, also known as Cider. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be back here at the monastery. He was wonderful from here. Thank, thank you for, thank you for coming back. Um. So, I know it's been about a year, a year or so since I ha since I had you on. Um. In, fa in fact, in fact, it would, if we did this a week later, it would have been a year to the day. Wow, good timing. <laughs> but how how have you been? How have you been holding up? I know I know you you can't you kind of disappeared for a while and then and then came back with the Kickstarter version of the Colossals. Right. So everything was going great and fine. And then in December, Hurricane, excuse me, Typhoon Odette, uh, also known as uh, Typhoon Rye in the local area, uh, went uh, right into my artist's city. Category 5 arrived right on his front step and ripped the roof off of his house. And uh, at that point, uh, we didn't know really what to do about that because that thrust his entire environment back into the dark ages the city was without power a great deal of their food had been washed out to sea uh so he had uh, this artist and i we were only able to communicate like every 17 hours because his brother had to travel excuse me his brother-in-law had to travel to another city to get the phone charged uh, the, the cover, in fact, to this uh, Kickstarter campaign here, the Colossals Part 1, this cover, he did the line art with a tarp over his head. No roof. And at that point, I made the decision, I can't do this. I'm not a slave driver, and I'm not going to make this guy like bend over backwards to try and meet the deadline, nor am I going to be several months late. It's not necessary. So I made the decision to refund everybody in January, and... I took some time to reassess exactly how I wanted to attack dealing with relaunching the book. Because I don't, I don't want to give up on this. It's just a hiccup in the natural order. And uh, at that point, my own health failed, and I ended up being in the hospital for over a month. And here we are. You know, I, I had to get back on my feet, and here we are relaunching on the 5th of July, 2022. Um, my late father's birthday, so I figured that would be a good omen. Relaunching. I can I can certainly get behind that. And that's and that's how it went down. Um, a lot of a lot of the situation was my health keeping me from being available really anywhere. Um, I have a disease known as Crohn's, so I have to have regular surgeries reconstructing my abdomen and. This this year, three of them happened in a row, and so I'm up to eight abdominal reconstructions now since 2017. So it kind of puts the brakes on development and really creating anything uh, in general because there's, there's just so much to deal with outside of the creative realm. It really disrupts your ability to also, like, laugh and be present in conversation and stuff like that due to all sorts of different circumstances so yeah. thankfully that's over with and we're back yeah, all, on track again. all that i all that i didn't know i i knew about i knew about what ha i knew about what happened in when it came to the typhoon and all that but that i didn't know i didn't know that there were the health issues as well because i do remember when that dropped i dm'd you just just saying Whenever you, whenever you want the door, the doors open for a comeback. 
Right, and here we are today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's what it is. Is uh, anyone who's who's you know like kind of even tangentially familiar with this disease knows that you could end up in the hospital with the drop of a hat. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, I was able to process most of the refunds by then, so that there wasn't a hiccup with anybody getting their refunds. And that's just the way it worked. I wanted to be honest with people, and so we reset to a smaller book. I had originally constructed the script back in 2020 to be able to be broken into three parts so I could uh, put, put this through Alterna after I crowdfunded it. So with the typhoon creating such a gigantic cataclysm within our production, I decided I'll just do it backwards. I'll put out a smaller book and then later on a collected edition, but that way there won't be months and months and months that this book is in development and then so many more variables that could cause cataclysm again. The book will be ready every time it funds, just like this one I have in my hands. So essentially, what you're, essentially you, your plan is to, um, to triple and shift it? Exactly. That's, that's what happened with this, is I broke it up into three parts, and this is part one that's funding now. Since, since you broke it up into three parts, I'm assuming that each part could be considered... A single act within the story, or or do you have, or is it three three act stories? Uh, no, is a it's considered a, an act. Uh, I tried to also build into this a four episode Netflix series. So if they wanted to <laughs> option, I tried to give every option I could to this, so I didn't have to fiddle with it to make it you know translate. Mm-hmm. And so the pacing of it matches a three book um, saga essentially. Yeah. Which I can I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that. Now and go ahead. When you originally did it, you put it on Indiegogo. Um, what made you go with Kickstarter instead of in, instead of Indiegogo? Well, there are two major reasons. Um, I am, uh, to my knowledge, and to the knowledge of those around me, the only person uh, Liam Gray has ever called the police on. And John De La Rose, uh, De La Rose is the only person that Liam has successfully deplatformed off of two platforms. And so to show solidarity with John, I moved over to Kickstarter. Now, the second reason, though, is that uh, the Department of Commerce here in the United States did a study in 2022 on crowdfunding because, of course, Uncle Sam has to get his cut. And... Uh, so the report came back that Indiegogo gets 6 million unique clicks a month. That's, that's different IP addresses accessing the website a month. Mm-hmm. And so in comparison, though, Kickstarter gets 15.8 million unique clicks a month. Mm-hmm. And so I saw that simply as a saturation uh, solution. That just just simply because of eyes on the website, more people would be seeing and, and looking at the colossals. So yeah. the, the choice was simple. Truth be t- truth be told, um, there's a couple minor problems that I do have with how Indiegogo does things. One of the one of them is the fact that that um if you go if you go onto something that you backed, it doesn't do the whole you're a backer and. Tra- and tracking what you've what you've backed and what you haven't isn't exactly as user friendly as I'd like. Right. Uh, in fact, I had I had an in, I had an instance with um, Tilt where where um where I ended up ba- I ended up backing it twice because so long had come bef- so long had come between the initial thing and I thought wait did I ba- did I back this. <laughs> and then I had to go through the whole thing of canceling the second one. Yeah, and again, trying to find it in in all of the way the listing is done, it's it's a nightmare on Indiegogo. Um, I've I've I think I've mentioned this to you in the past, but I I've, I've studied web usability in the past, and navigation is one of those big things that I don't budge on. And again, I mean, that's why Kickstarter has sort of a superior kind of layout. I also just really like how their their campaign layouts work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, there's a nice timer cu- countdown with their system. 
Whereas Indigo goes a little more abrupt. Um, I think. Oh, also, I think I think Indiegogo's taken a bit taken a bit of a reputation hit regarding some some of the more pie in the sky project projects, especially in the tech sphere. Um, uh, truth be told, um, you know the crowdfunding itself is its own sort of risky situation. And that's why I went and made sure that I got, I have actually 20 copies of this black and white lettered version of this comic mm -hmm. for two reasons. Um, one was to demonstrate that the book is real. The book is, is real and it's not hocus pocus, it just needs color. And the other reason was to test and make sure that the printer that I was using didn't have a roller drift problem. Um, so what happens is is that sometimes a printer will be printing out things so fast that there'll be just a slight drift in how the paper is being fed through the roller. So every few pages, the art or the lettering or the centering will just fall right off the side of the page. Mm -hmm. And I made sure that that was not the case with this printer by printing out 20 individual copies and going through them to make sure that nothing had any slip to it whatsoever. So... It, with these with these Indiegogos and Kickstarters on both ends, sometimes the product is just simply vaporware and it'll never come to existence. I think Richard Pace is almost seven years into not fulfilling a campaign. So And meanwhile, you know, since since you mentioned Le since you mentioned Lean, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that um I don't I don't like the fact that I that I decided to disown him, but um I never got my book. I never got Z I never got Xenotype. Same here. See, and I helped with the development of that as well. So, of all people who should have got a copy of me, you know. But I'm on the list of the cursed 17 that'll never receive their books. Liam has swore upon something important to him that I'd, those 17 I don't even I don't even I don't even know if he even remembers who I am even though I had him on the, in the temple. Again, the guy reinvents himself like every forty-eight hours, so he might not even know who he is right now. Um, what is he trying to be, Moon Knight or something? Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a there's a conspiracy that there's several different Liams that have converged in some multiversal crisis in Australia, and we're seeing the different Liams, not the same guy every time. Um. All I all I know is that I never is I never re I never real. Then again, um, I can pro I can probably end that thing by say by saying he is that he is living proof that gingers have no souls. Yeah, it's 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 hard to like a guy like that. He makes it real hard. It wasn't from lack of trying on on my part, and I was I was outside looking in for a lot of the stuff that happened. Mm -hmm. But once, he, but. Once, once all the, when you're good, when you're trying, when you're trying to get some, when you're trying to get somebody shit canned, that's when it's a case of okay, I am done with you. Yeah, that's when the fight's gone too far. Oh. Go outside and touch grass. And I, I never, I didn't speak, I didn't speak to him on on the matter. I just, I was just like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you and I aren't talking. Um, and I barely, it's. I don't. I don't have as much of a personal stake as what as I did with the whole, ja the whole Jameson and Satine thing, which mm. I've already covered that elsewhere. <laughs> That's a whole other thing I don't want to get into. But when I when I one thing that I did notice because there because there there was some different art that's used on the Kickstarter page, and for whatever reason. I know a lot of people are pro are probably th are probably thinking of the Avengers or the or the Justice League when it comes to this superhero team that you've made, but for me personally, for whatever reason, I'm reminded more of the Titans or Teen Titans back in the day. Was that an influence, or am I just reading into things too much? Uh, no, I I took many different team influences. Um, I was criticized a lot for trying to do a team book as my first uh, outing, that I should focus on a singular character. And there's wisdom in that, don't get me wrong, this was no easy task. But it was the Titans, it was the Avengers, the Justice League, um, several different anime uh, teams, Super Sentai teams. 
I, I tried to pull from every, my main goal with this was to make sure that everybody who looked at it could find something that would make them try to open the cover and find out what's going on. Somebody on this cover, some one of these characters will stand out to somebody and they'll want to know more. And I understand why some people had hesitation because I think, I think some people are still traumatized from the days of Youngblood. <laughs> sure. <laughs> As somebody who read through that whole that whole the like the first five issues of Young Blood, it's completely understandable because Liefeld just kept introducing more and more characters. Um, yep. And well, there's a lot I could say about Liefeld, but I'll simply say that McFarland's nickname for Liefeld was the idiot. Okay. Well, I think I think I mean... that alone I think that alone speaks volumes. <laughs> yeah. Right. I kind of cuts right to the, the point, doesn't it? And all of, of, there's also the fact that during the Deathmate crossover event between Image and Valiant, um, he was so he was so late on the on the pencils that the the guy who was supposed the guy who was going to be handling the inking job did a did a sit in at Liefeld's house and wouldn't leave until he got the pencils. That's one way to get it done, right? Oh. Twist the arm. This isn't twisting the arm. This is put it this is putting the arm in a chicken wing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But he and af afterwards he he inked them right in, right at his hotel <laughs> because of because he would the whole the whole deathmate thing was a sh was a shit show is the best way for me to put it. It's then again then again a lot of image stuff was notoriously late. It's kind of their thing. Yeah. Although I although I'd say I'd say Mc, I'd say yeah, McFarlane and Lee were the were the least of the issues, largely because McFarlane actually actually ha had a vision of what he wanted to do, and Lee was the sensible of the image crew. He was our, yeah, he, he was, was a real a, nine to fiver. Um. He was a family man by the time Image started, mm. but I the point my point is is that I can understand why people have that trepidation, but I think a I think a I think an interesting question to ask, and I'm asking this kind of rhetorically, is why is it a bad th why is it a bad thing to in, to introduce a cast to introduce a cast of characters in the first issue. Uh, to to answer that for people who may have a little confusion out in the audience, the reason why is that it doesn't allow the narrative to sit on any one character long enough for you to establish a sort of bond with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so so you, you care about what's happening in their work. And what I did is I sat down with the X-Men comics, because the X-Men did not start out as just one guy. It started yeah. off as a team right out of the gate. Same mm -hmm. thing with the Fantastic Four. And rather than read those stories, I went through and I watched how the artists were representing their interactions with each other, and I started making up the dialogue of the characters based on their mannerisms and how the artists were showing their emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's how I decided how to that's how I decided to convey these characters in a in a less factual, you know, like this character's this height, this character grew up here, that kind of thing and more on their personalities and how they interplay with one another the way the X-Men did. You learn more about Wolverine when he's interacting with Scott and Jean than you do when he's out in the middle of the woods chopping down trees with his claws. Yeah, and you also, you also learn that Scott's a bit of an asshole. <laughs> That's the whole part of their dynamic, is that in one, in one page, you can reveal a lot about a character without itemizing it, like he was born here, he had this many years in high school, blah, blah, blah. Just a few panels, and you've completely unwrapped a character, so... I think the, I think the other reason why... I can't... The reason why I asked that bit of rhetorical is... I'm, I'm kind of coming to the question of... If, of is that... And is that an actual case that that it's a bad idea to do that, or is it, or is it a case of of people relying on traditions, i.e., what you're the idea of what you're supposed to do, what I call designed by gospel. 
it's it's true that there is like a, a sort of uh, this is the wheel you don't need to reinvent it vibe around introducing heroes, especially in the modern era. There's this belief that you st you have to make issue number one their origin story, even though at no point in the prior ninety nine years of comics has that ever been how characters were introduced. Iron Man was just a part of an anthology. He was just a random character to fill out some pages, and he Same he with introduced him exactly. And 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 they were introduced midway through their careers. They weren't. This was not like day one for them, and so. That was the logic I applied with this, is that it's less confusing to people if you just show the heroes being heroes. They'll worry about where they came from later on. And a rebuttal that I'd, a rebuttal that I'd have personally is, well, let, let's get the obvious out of the way. We've, ha we have, we've had 45 years worth of Super Sentai introducing whole teams in their first episodes. Right, it's not impossible. <laughs> I mean, over and over again, like the Justice League introduced a team. Snyder was kind of goofy with it, but it works sort of. Um, I, when you mentioned Justice League, the 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 Snyder the Snyder thing wasn't what I was thinking of. I was thinking no. of the of the Bruce Tim Justice League. Yes. Yep. Yep. The cartoons. Yes, the cartoons. Obviously, like there's GI Joe, the uh, Bionic Six. Transformers, uh, uh, <laughs> Transformers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, the list goes on and on. Even today, now there's still all ensemble casts that are being revealed all on day one. So let's c uh, consider for, consider for a moment the um, the amount of characters that you that you ha that you have to introduce in a lot of in a lot of dramas that show up on net on Netflix and similar places. They're, I remember watch rewatching season one of Westworld. You know the only good season, and <laughs> there's there's like four or five different characters and two diff and two major thematic perspectives that you end up seeing. Basically, basically in basically in inside Westworld and outside and outside of it, and the people and the people within it kind of running parallel to each other. Um, you know, as t as. I'm tempted to bring up Game of Thrones, even even though we know how that story ended, but that's another but that's another example of it because you had because right out of the gate you had um, you had two per you had two perspectives, um, the the pe the people surrounding House Lannister and the people surrounding House Stark. And and again, that was it's okay to have that, but that was. They entirely misrepresented that, especially with uh, Daenerys and how her role came to be played uh, between those two houses. Yeah, and I'm I'm not I'm not saying Game of Thrones is the best is the best example with this. No, but, no. But the point the point is is that it is that introducing a on a ensemble does ha does happen. Oh yes, yes, quite frequently, especially in children's media, especially. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, a cynical person would say that the reason they introduce an ensemble in children's media is to sell is to sell more toys. But the, but that's the that's the reason why I that's the reason why I didn't use I didn't want to use um that that as an ex as an example I wanted to, let's oh let's consider let's consider for instance something like Stranger Things that already had a handful of characters introduced right out of the gate. Yes. Um, every every incar every incarnation of the Doctor has a not a, not a large cast, but a de but a decent sized ensemble cast. Whenever whenever the new incarnation presents himself. Yes. Um, usually, usually maybe one maybe one or two compa maybe one or two companions. Some, sometimes more. It it ultimately depends, but there is there is a way to do it, and it's it's um it's generally a, it's generally you, the general setup is introduce them that introduce them and then build build up the think the things that came before. Uh, right, and that's that again. Like um, Superman, for instance, the world's first superhero as we classically understand them. 
Uh, Superman did not begin his debut in comics in Sutton's Field. Uh, he did not begin it at Smallville High, even. He was an adult pitching a car into a boulder. Hmm. That was how Superman met the world. And so, uh, again, to, to borrow from, from history, the, the concept of superheroes is not to make them into gods. The concept of superheroes is for them to be inspirational. Either even in deconstructionist theory, they're meant to inspire something, either good or bad. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, per, for me personally, I've, I've, I've always, I've held the belief that, um, de that deconstru that deconstruction is pointless if you don't, if you don't um, use that space to build something new. Well, this is the thing with deconstruction, and I, I almost wholly and entirely reject uh, doing that because, again, I, I, I believe in the inspiration aspect and deconstructing a superhero, you inspire the wrong ideas, in my opinion. But I don't judge other people who want to go that route because there are fascinating stories. Before Watchmen became the flavor of the week, it was actually a compelling critique of the superhero um, pop culture. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and that, then it became the flavor of the week, and now it's as cliche as the boys. So, uh, you know, just just how time and future, you know, future proof it became. You know, so when when you're dealing with deconstruction, you're defying the the formula of the superhero. So it should be done poetically, and a lot of these these deconstructions were done out of anger or mockery of the archetypal superhero. Again, everyone's allowed to do what they do. But deconstruction at the core starts with the destruction of inspiration. Yeah, um, I've mentioned this in the past, but I, th but when it com when it comes to when it comes to deconstruction, it should be treated like a ritual burning, um, bur burning what burning what's there to cr to create room for something new, something a like Viking funeral pyre. Yeah, something like something like Watchmen, while it. While it certainly deconstructs, it does. It doesn't. Cre it doesn't create anything new. Um, I'd say. I'd say. An, I'd say another example of this kind of thing. One that. One that's. One. One that has. One that has as much damage as Watchmen, but a lot of people don't want to acknowledge this fact. Is Scream. Okay. Yeah. Scream is very much trying to deconstruct horror tropes. Right on their face. Yeah, the whole the whole thing is meant to be a ritual burning of a lot of the of a lot of the slasher tropes that dominated the eighties. Right. But the but the pro the problem is, it ended up, it ended up being it ended up being used as a way, as a way to bludgeon, um, ho bludgeon horror geeks. Period. And. There, and even and even with it even with it doing that, all that it created was more slashers. You didn't really get something new until, as, much, as hard as it is to believe, Saw. Yeah, and then that lingered for a while until we the, the whole gore porn thing lingered for a while until we got Freddy Fazbear, and now everybody and their brothers doing a rogue animatronic story. Mm-hmm. I think the Winnie the Pooh thing that's coming out soon is another rogue animatronic story. Um, it is. It is trying to do. I don't know if it's rogue animatronic, but it is doing the whole. Dark, it is doing a dark. A, the idea of doing a darker spin on a. On a on a on a childhood fantasy, and to that to that I say, if you want if you want a darker spin on a childhood fantasy, we had that decades ago. It's called Death the Smoochie. Which yeah, I, that I was should brilliant. Note, I should note cuz some people brought that up when in that conversation I'm like and I I had specifically said Death to Smoochie is not a deconstruction. It's a black comedy. It can accomplish both though because Death to Smoochie took you out of the victim's role. And I know a lot of these movies did that too, but because of Robin Williams' star power, Death the Smoochie got more traction than a lot of the other ones did. 
whereas you were riding along with the killer. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, Taxi Driver was the last one that I think got as popular as Death the Smoochie did in that riding along with the bad guy kind of thing. This is, this is I speak to, um, to some newbies. For some reason, they come to me, and I don't know why. But if, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm Cider Hype on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But um, so I tell them, like, you know, remember that to the villain, they are the protagonist. And that's how you that's how like Death the Smoochie continues to stand out, not like Scream does. Because Death the Smoochie was the deconstruction of things like Halloween, of things like the obsessive killer trope. Mm -hmm. And and that felt really good. And then the other one that Robin Williams did was uh one hour photo. Mm -hmm. And that one was so disturbing. Like I don't know how he got into that space. It's like Heath Ledger, night to day different kind of acting. Crazy. I always, t I always, I always tell people to be very careful of going the character actor route because, with cer with certain roles, it will swallow you whole. Because keep in mind, if you're a character actor, you're in character twenty four seven. Yes. And Jared um, Leto went overboard with this. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And um, I remember, I remember hearing that Jack Nicholson had warned Heath Ledger about taking the role of Joker. That if he wasn't careful, the thing was going to eat him alive. And yeah, well, look what happened to Heath. Yeah, because Heath is Heath was very much a character actor. Mm. Um, and not, and I don't I don't know why I said character. I was I was talking about method, and I ended up saying character actor. The two aren't the same, so that so my bad on that part. I kind of fucked. I up. I know what you were talking about though, but method acting is a, is a similar manner. I used yep. to be a stage actor when I was younger, um, and so I, I understand these things. I used to go and find people that I wanted to do the physical mannerisms of, and try to mimic what yeah, they did for days. Carrie is also is also a stage is also a um, method actor. Um, when it comes to the whole being being in character constantly, um, yes. And I mo I mostly know about that due to due to um, the stories that Jerry Lawler had said when he was working with him for Man on the Moon. Okay. Uh, and he he in throughout the, throughout the production he insisted on being on being called Andy. Uh, huh. And well, L Lawler found Lawler found him just kind of weird. Can't ne can't necessarily argue with that though. <laughs> but well, if you're playing Andy Kaufman. Who was a who was a bit of a weird a king was, of weird? Yeah. Um. But I think one the one one other th one other um debate that I've I've seen I've seen off and on when it comes to when it comes to supers is is ba is balancing having hi having high tech and ma and magic and a and aliens all in this all in the same universe. Um. Yeah. Some fe some feel that that try that trying to balance all three is a is asking too much. What do you what do you think about that kind of thing? Well, I'm not ashamed to admit it. DC Comics, either inadvertently or however they came to it, they came up with a triad of power. And what this situation is is that they have alien technology and magic on this triangle. So you have alien defeats technology, technology defeats magic, magic defeats alien. And so what I did was I said, control C, control V. <laughs> that, that's a perfect way to handle, it's thematically satisfying as well. You want to see the outsider triumph over the establishment and what's more established than high tech. And then you want to see the, the scruffy inventor overcome the aged, cursed wizard. And then you want to see the wizard defend Earth from invading aliens. Mm. So thematically, it satisfies what you want to see in the story. And that's how I approach this. I also hate magic. In, in every fictional realm that I can, I've ever absorbed, magic always disobeys its own rules. The writer ends up paying, even Tolkien did this a, a couple times. You get painted into a corner with your magic, and you end up breaking your rules in order to satisfy the story because the story is more important than the stupid rules. But it ir it irritated me.
because it's just so repetitive. And Harry Potter does this as well. Every every fictional magic system, magic system, other than like you know D and D and stuff, other than like comics and movies and novels, they all break their rules. So I said, magic only has one rule. You have to have a divine soul in order to cast spells. That's it. That's it. And although to be to be fair, oh. I have less. I have less of an issue with magic and stories than I do with time travel. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Time and travel. See, I treated that. Go is ahead. A fu- time travel is a fucking minefield. Yes. Yep. And this is how I handled it. I decided that the ramifications of time travel mimic how reality warping magic works. So I said in the Ciderverse, which is where. The Colossals takes place. In the Ciderverse, traveling through time requires magic. You cannot achieve it with technology. You can travel between universes with technology, but you cannot travel through time with technology. Mm-hmm. And because it just, every time that they show like history changing, like one of the more famous ones in my mind is, I don't know if you recall this because it was like a blip on the radar. But it was the big guy and Rusty. It was on Fought Four Kids. Oh, I remember. remember that? <laughs> yeah, uh, I love kinda that show. Kind of hard to forget because I've I've had a running gag that that um that every every character that John Delancey plays is part of the Q continuum. Okay, all right, <laughs> I, I'll buy it. He he acts just like you. <laughs> it's like if Q never got his powers back. Mm-hmm. So uh, and who wouldn't want a monkey? But yeah. uh, the, uh, if you guys don't know, uh, feel free to, after this video, go on and, and Google The Big Guy and Rusty. It's one of the more unique 90s offerings done by the same studio that did the Men in Black cartoon and the Godzilla cartoon. So the monsters are very unique and the character designs are very unique. Um, SF Debris did a, did, has done reviews of a, of a few episodes from that series. And uh, yeah. I, I love Chuck Sonnenberg's um, work. When it, com- when it comes to reviewing science fiction, and he's pro- he's probably one of the best Star Trek reviewers you'll ever find. Oh. Also, the only guy in the universe who hates Janeway more than me. Okay, that's a pretty tall order, so <laughs> I gotta... All right. Go, go. All right. Oh. So that's that's the... Uh, the um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought thinking about Janeway, of course. I I will ad- I will admit that one particular use of time travel that I that I'm fond of even if even if it does stretch its rules d- due to having to juggle multiple timelines is the w- is the way time wor- the way time travel works in The Legacy of Kane. Okay. Um Lar- largely, be- largely because it's an inversion of the self-realization principle. The t- which be- it is. You mean basic- it doesn't create a paradox? It pr- it pr- it creates the idea that time is a self-correcting process. Ah, okay. Um, if some, i.e., if if someone goes back and change, I've Step described on a it butterfly, at- right? I've described. Not no, not a butterfly effect. We're not dealing. With, we're not dealing. We no, are that's s- what I mean. Is that this is kind of an inversion of that? That yeah. if you stepped on the butterfly, it still wouldn't change anything. No, what what oh. ends up ha- what ends up hap- what ends up happening is that if if a change to history is made, then history will al- will alter itself to make the change fit, as if the change as if the change was always part Maybe. of history. Okay. See, that that's reminds me of what I was getting at about the big guy and Rusty, is that one of the episodes featured the big guy suit being sent back to the Revolutionary War in America. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the British were the ones that came into possession of it, and it was throwing cannonballs. Because, you know, people back in the 1700s could totally wrap their head around an atomic-powered 12-foot-tall robot. <laughs> but, anyway... Um, <laughs> sometimes that show. But, uh... When they returned to the future, uh, everyone had British accents. The, everything was hyper advanced because the big guy had been reverse engineered by the 1800s. So we had atomic energy before World War One happened. 
and it was a, it did all these spiral effects out of it. And to me, that was like, well, you could have just casted a magic spell and accomplished the same thing. And that was the logic I applied to time travel and how the paradoxical nature of it would be corrected. Because as you said, uh, in, in that theory, reality would alter itself to make the time tra to make the change native. It would, magic does the same thing. The reality warping magic does the same thing. But the big pro the big problem that that um that, that I think has to be addressed anytime you introduce um, time travel or magic is you're dealing with something that can potentially do and do anything and everything. So you yes. need to put a bottleneck on that. Yep. Um, I'm. I'm fo I'm fond of how Brandon Sanderson handles magic in his in his books, where he where he goes out he goes out of his way to create a to create a system, mm. and is and keeps things very consistent within that system, even going so far as to answer fan que answer um fan questions. Okay. Because Sanderson's a fucking machine. <laughs> yeah, that's an understatement. Um. And I hope to, I did, I did have a bit of a laugh when I found out that Bandai Namco had reached out to him about the possibility of of having him of having him work with Miyazaki sometime in the future. Uh, that, uh <laughs> my brain can't wrap around that. that <laughs> wow, uh, that's a showstopper. Um, he said that he had some ideas, but he all but he always has ideas. Well, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> I yeah, he's Brandon I Sanderson. I don't know if anything's <laughs> gonna, come out, gonna come out gonna come out of it, but let's not forget this is the same guy who ended up writing four novels while he was supposed to be on vacation. He wrote one while he was on a plane. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. Uh, but uh like Yeah, it. the system the system uh what I decided and you get a little bit of it in this first one here as I introduce you to kind of the ground level. Because what I wanted to do was not like strangle people with mm -hmm. this universe. So what I made sure to do is that even though this reads like issue number one hundred, despite being number one, I don't throttle you and and like shove so much lore down your throat you don't really know what's going on. I keep it pointed at the antagonist while kind of unfolding the 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 heroes as sort of uh, on the sidelines of what's happening. Mm -hmm. with the villain and so that way uh the magic system becomes more evident um as the timeline of these characters who practice it is revealed um as you read in the bio on kickstarter delilah church is uh suggested to be much older than she claims to be now she claims to be from the 12th century uh spain back when leon was part of spain her father was the king of leon and she tells the story of having to banish her first grandson from the kingdom because magic, he believed magic was the key to utopia. Because I like a villain that has a little bit of, uh, you know what, that, that, I could see how you got there, dude. I know you got really twisted up, but I see how you got there. So I like a villain that isn't sort of like whipped and tortured into being a bad guy. He just ended up there because his, he thought his solution was best. And so... That was that's how I applied to this this magic system was Delilah Church is a magic hoarder. You're going to see a few previews of this in the story itself and, and how she deals with magic users and, and magic beasts as well. It's a little bit of preview in there. Mm. But Delilah goes around and traps spells in jewelry. Now because of this, she has a gigantic treasure trove that she has no idea which spells are which because part of sealing these spells in these rings erases the memory of them from the world. So she herself forgets where the spells are and which jewelry does what. So Delilah's part of Delilah's story is trying to find the appropriate ring to cast the appropriate spell because she herself has erased her memory mm -hmm. of those spells. Now, the caveat to this, the, the, the wrench I threw in, was that an ancient evil before she started hoarding magic starts, is shown up at the end of this book. Okay, spoiler alert. Okay? Um, he shows up at the end of the book, and, and that guy remembers the spells natively. He does not need um, 
jewelry or spell books. He knows all of it by heart. And so that makes him a devastating villain to have around. Mm -hmm. So, and I won't reveal his motivations because he's not till the second arc, which is called Mark of Merlin. Yeah. This is just this is called End of Miracles. This mm -hmm. first series is called End of Miracles. Yeah. And with in the in that same vein, I couldn't I couldn't help but notice that the the members of the cast who have who have some sort of supernatural bent um are getting it from somewhere, t tying into that whole you need some you need some sort of divine connection in order to use magic. Yes, because on the so, other hand, you have um, you have Jimmy. Yes. Yep. Uh, so, in in this setting, one of the things I found fascinating in our world here in reality is that Genghis Khan is related to eleven percent of the world's population. The entire planet shares some DNA with Genghis Khan. Mm -hmm. Now that's because he was a prolific rapist and that's terrible and no one should practice that. But if you apply that logic to an immortal, right? An immortal's going around and having kids for centuries on end. Well, those kids are going to stack up after a while and they're going to start going out and having their own families. Same way Genghis Khan's children did. So in this universe, rather than having the X gene or the bang babies or whatever the either natural evolution of humans into superhumans was. In my setting, these are um, a deep, long genetic string evolution from Nephilim. So the children of fallen angels have become superheroes on Earth, the far distant descendants of fallen angels. You want to know what's kind, so, of, um, kind of amusing about that? That's that's not too far removed from the origin of magic in Orphan, if you've seen okay. that anime. No, I have not, no. So oh. the fallen angels become kind of guardians for Earth, is that? With or with Orphan, um there were there were a group of a handful of dra of dragons, which are basically celestials. And the term dragon is is used a bit loosely. For e mm -hmm. for them, yeah. one of them took a um chose chose to chose to breed with humans, and the descendants of that are sorcerers. Okay, all right. But yep. while the while the uh, while the other dragons do exist, they absolutely hate sorcerers. Hmm. Because because they see because they see them as thieves, defilers. And, yeah. Um, Makes perfect sense. You end up. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. no. no idea. So um, I just bring that up to to demonstrate that there's a bit of precedent with this kind of thing. I know. Yeah. So, I know some people look at it as as elitist with the whole you have to be born special, but that's not too how that's not too different from certain. Genet from certain genetic advantages that some people have. Um, right. There, there was a story about a decade ago, of a of a kid because of it who, because of a genetic mutation that he had, and I know that sounds scary, but it's more common than you think, where he developed more muscle mass than fat. Mm. So even the, even though he, even though he was, even though he even even though he was like younger than 10 he looked like he, he looked like he was made out of a he looked like a brick shit house um, yeah there there there's some there are some stories of a of a family in Italy who despite having a despite having a high risk diet has absolutely no history of heart problems wow that's something for the Italians and there, and um, I do remember one specific story of a muti of a of a gene called LRP5 that, in one instance, led to very brittle bones, and in another instance, led to ver very very um, very dense bones. Uh, yeah, the overcalcification. Yeah, not almost almost 
the film Unbreakable was used as a point of comparison when the when the story broke. Oh right, okay, yeah. Um. Uh, so, and while though while those are certainly ac accidental, can be seen as accidental. There's there are there are cases where cert where certain certain traits are in are in are inherited. Um. Yes. Uh, lobster hands, for instance. Mm -hmm. Please forgive the term. <laughs> I, I am a hick from Maine. Despite how I speak, I am from Maine, so I don't... <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know the actual medical term, but you know what I'm talking about with lobster hands. That's genetic. I don't judge. That on, so. oh, and I appreciate that. <laughs> there's... A lot, a lot of it is, of course, is of course, is of course adapting to one's environment. That's why you have a lot of tall people in ver in very um, in very mountainous areas of of say Europe. Um, mm. but but the point the point is is that if 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 there's that if there's that kind of thing that's pr that's present in the real world, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to bring to have that kind of thing present in. Um, in a more fantastical realm, because we're not ta we're not talking about this about some noble lin about some noble lineage going back generations or some shit. We're talking about people who have who have this have this one um, trait from generations upon generations ago. Yes, and that's that's what I see. I was fascinated by how um, oh my uh, Hoshikori. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, that's my hair academia right mm -hmm. uh how how they handled uh my hair academia's world uh i i liked the, the beginning of it i fell off when they killed stars and stripes because i just felt that was very mean-spirited but um the the my hair academia world kind of recontextualized x-men uh, it, it kind of explained a, a more open and proud x-men if you'll excuse the term but uh this world is where superheroes weren't uh, shunned. They weren't mm -hmm. hated. But in fact, it was a little bit the opposite. People who weren't superpowered were sort of second-class citizens because of their quote-unquote disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And so I was fascinated by how that worked out. It wasn't like a flip of the coin to the X-Men universe. It, they, uh, Hoshikori actually tried to uh, reverse engineer something special. So I took a look at that, and I and I... I thought, what would make people okay with having so many superpowered and unique individuals around? Mm -hmm. And I opted with this setting. People have experienced a great amount of like global trauma. Mm -hmm. I like alternate history. So I, I went back and I warped certain events that didn't necessarily alter the ultimate trajectory, like you said about destination. But I altered the event in history to replace certain cultural events so that the outcome brought us to an America that was more that was less concerned with the racial background of people and more concerned with the fundamental beliefs like Cold War beliefs of people in the 70s and 80s so when we were still dealing with the race uh, riots and stuff in the 70s and 80s in our world in my setting all of that was put to rest because um, so I'll get into the deep lore, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, you guys, uh, so this is the deep lore. If you've made it this far, congratulations. This is the bonus round. But, um, I have, this setting goes back 12,000 years into Noah's time. And so Star Supreme is the second Star Supreme. And without getting too confusing with that, um, basically there was a Star Supreme before this that didn't go by that name. But had all of her trappings, all of her powers and whatnot. So in that setting, she interfered with the Battle of Midway. And rather than having Pearl Harbor happen, um, everything was put to a stop by her melting the engines and boiler rooms of the Japanese ships. So they were unable to accomplish getting close enough to launch an attack on Pearl Harbor. And then in the Battle of Midway, she interfered with the Japanese ability to defend themselves by bringing down several of their planes. So in this regard, though, we find out that she was held hostage by FDR, threatening to use a nuclear bomb to wipe out the remaining, remainder of her people. So 
that was the point of uh, Little Boy, was to wipe out the rest of this first Star Supreme's people in case she didn't help the U.S. defeat Japan. What that ultimately led to was Japan being annexed into the United States, which brought a whole cultural revolution in the 70s when the American Summer of Love began, and that was incredibly offensive to the freshly Americanized Japanese. Hmm. So what ended up happening was the Japanese cultural reformation movement in my setting at the end of the 70s into the 80s, which led to a massive export of Japanese culture, Japanese fundamentals, in the United States economy and popular culture, which resulted in a much more reserved and peaceful people. As such, we didn't interfere with the Soviets in the 70s, and we didn't end up having 9-11 because of that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, just to wrap this up really quick, what happens with this setting and the reason why um, people are, are accepting of superpowered individuals is that a lot of Japanese lore talks about uh, people with uh, the great power comes great responsibility is the easiest takeaway from this. And a lot of Japanese mythos talks about that. Of course, Bushido is all about that as well. So when these individuals rise to prominence, there was not a, a fear of their allegiance. You didn't have to worry about them like, for instance, Soldier Boy pitching a car through your house because he's pissed off at a street gang for charging him too much for his cocaine. You won't have that. These, these people have, are brought up in a culture of reverence, not only for their nation, but for their families. Mm -hmm. So that's all. And when you mentioned that whole alternate history thing, the first thing that came to mind, oddly enough, is Jinro. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, see, I like it when Japan is a state of the United States. I don't see it too often in fiction. I'm not really sure why, because that is just such an obvious pathway to take. But uh, maybe it's a culture clash. I'm not sure. But either way, I love it when Japan is part of the United States. So many crazy, cool things happen when that happens. Well, the, the funny thing is that's not what ha have you Have you seen um, Jinro? I haven't. I've heard about it, though. Um, now, Jin. That was an adaptation of of one story in a in a in a long running long running manga. That's more of more of world building and individual stories than trying to tell one overarching one. Right. But one of the big what it started off is with the concept of the Axis winning World War Two, but there were a few. But it wasn't exactly a. We're not dealing with say. Wolfenstein the New Colossus here. It wasn't a clean victory. Well, for for starters, while they while they won, the other thing that happened was that Operation Valkyrie, the the plot to assassinate Hitler, was successful. Oh, that's a neat twist. And this created such a massive power vacuum that even though even though Japan was um at was annexed by the Germans, once Operation Valkyrie happened and things got worse, and they and especially especially when the Soviets started coming started becoming more and more of a thing, Germany was like we're pulling out, <laughs> and pretty and pretty much yeeted themselves out of Japan. But a lot of um, by the time by the time of by the time of Jinro, a lot of German culture had kind of integrated within within Japan. Mm. And of course, this this includes the this includes the Wolf Brigade. Who, the the big reason why they why they look like German shock troopers and are using MIGs, is be, is because of that. Um, okay. And there's a, there's a whole lot more that I could get into, but it's basically a, basically a few small changes having the having these massive um, consequences, and it's not like there are. There are some there are some Japanese nationalists that want that want to go back to the good old days or anything like that. You, there is there is terrorism, there is political unrest, but it's political unrest due to the consequences of what happens. Right. Uh, of course, a lot of people know that Gen that Jinro is a classic, but I think but I bring that up because a lot of people a lot of people have this idea that Jinro is a, is an action anime. It's not. It's more. It's far more like more of a political, political thriller. thriller. Yeah, 
Yeah, because the way you're describing it is it sounds like a, like a Brad Thor novel on fucking cocaine. It sounds awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I definitely prefer, I definitely prefer that because you, you look at a lot of stories of, of um, what, of what if the Axis won World War Two, and it's, it, it plays, it plays way too much into the whole the Nazis took, o- took over America thing, which, yes, for me that's a case of been there, done that. Oh, and, and it's always the most far fetched results of that too. It, it it's the craziest kind of ultimate um, outcome. It's the it's the car, it's the cartoonish outcome. Yes, yeah. The the man in the high tower having a giant incinerator building in the middle of New York, cartoonish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and well, well that well that can be that can be fine to a point. I reject the idea that that's the way you have to do it. Right. I made a I made a distinct choice to avoid the Western theater when I was altering history. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to invest myself in that because it seems like every Western writer has to insert something into the Western theater and the, the Nazi occult. I, I just see so much of that. And I'm so tired of the swastika. And at the time of World Look, the War II, on, the only time right? I want to see the only time I want to see anything like a manji is when I'm reading Blade of the Immortal. Right. <laughs> it, 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 it's it, this is what I'm getting to is that I wanted to build a bridge to Japan. There's there's a there's a mistake that that American comics and and please if you're listening out there in indie world, uh, know that what I'm about to say is not supposed to be like a knife to the heart or anything like that. Uh, it's supposed to be just sort of a, a little bit of a nudge, like, hey, remember, we're competing against manga, and, you know, everybody moved into having four, four uh, excuse me, moved into having V8s and automatic transmissions when it became cool, remember? So maybe we ought to do the same thing. Cigarettes started adding filters when it started being cool, you know? So maybe we ought to do that. So we're... What I'm encouraging and what I did is I took a look at what works in manga, Japanese video games, and particularly what appeals to a Japanese audience. Because of the success of manga, because of the success of of anime and Japanese video games, Mm -hmm. uh, because that's what the public consciousness is looking at. And so if you're going to have any hope of reaching out and, and touching the consumer, you have to kind of move the way that they're used to seeing products you want to sell move. I've um, I've been ve- I've been very critical of ch- of um chasing the past. I remember when Razor Fist did his, did his whole thing of reject modernity, embrace pulp heroism. I was like, you're cre- you're trading one problem for another by doing that kind of thing. What should be done instead is if is if we're if you're if we're going to be using the past as in, as inspiration, we have to build upon that instead of creating an anachronism. Thank you. The, there are two main reasons why ma- why manga met, has has so managed to overtake comics. Now, putting aside the obvious, in the words of Napoleon, "Never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake," but part of it part of it is the fact that you that so much of Comics, both, and this is not a new problem. Has been has been catering to the to an to an older audience, to the collect to the collector, the person the right. person who got who buys back issues by the by the dozen. The person who will pay five dollars for that Superman comic that makes mm-hmm. no sense. Yeah, and what and while. While com- while comic books were saved a bit by the- by the introduction of the- of trade paperbacks, it was really a bandage, because even trade paperbacks introduced a new problem with decompression. Mm. But the but even with that, it's still you're st- you're still um you're still you- you're doing deconstruction after deconstruction, which is bi- which is operating under the assumption that you're familiar with superhero mythos. And you're dealing with, and you're dealing with the issue of, char- of um, of call of calling ba- of calling back to the past, constantly, 
while not it while not at while not adding something to to what to the foundation that you're calling to um and mean and mean cuz if you look at the story beats with a lot of with a lot of manga the the broad story beats and the broad story themes aren't necessarily new but they're but they're being but they're being presented in a ma in a manner that w that was uh, that was going to be far more approachable because of the fact that it didn't have baggage and I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that we need that we need to reboot everything because nobody can keep up with that amount with that amount of backstory. I I reject that argument. But what? But what does what what does need to ha what does need to happen is stop use is stop using what came before as a dogma. Um. Here's I, here's where Razor Fist kind of uh, makes sense in a way, and I, I'm not I'm not trying to throw it back in your face or anything. No. But this when I watched that same video, the impression I got from that was take a look at Pulp and then make it yours. And so, see, like I'm a fan of like how they handled uh, Homelander in the Boys show. Like I don't like the Boys a lot, but they made a lot of good decisions in that show. I will say, I, having read the Boys comic, the TV show yes. is better. Yes, thank you. <laughs> especially, thank you so much. especially what they did with Black Noir. It was Soldier Boy as well. Like I am so blown away with what they did with so Soldier Boy. Completely changed that character. Mm -hmm. But uh, back to the back to the point. Um, the um, with soup with the. With the the, I'm sorry, I got thinking about Soldier Boy, <laughs> but uh, I, I I just really impressed with how they handled that. But yeah, um, but yeah. I can, I can, it's more my my issue is that I've I've put up I put up with this whole we need we need to go we need to go back to this good old days thing in tabletop gaming for twenty years. Yes, you're right. That's oh. a, it's been especially hard in there too. It's the reason why I why I don't get on with a lot of the OSR crowd because I am I have very I have very distinct problems with 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 say AD and D first or, first or second edition and I've made those problems cl clear over the years especially especially regarding the fact that. Um, not everybody is going not everybody's going to be all that gung ho in trying to do Tolkien style fantasy. And if you want if you want to do something else, which is going to happen especially these days, those old, a lot of the, a lot of those style of games aren't going to be willing to aren't going to be all that able to support it. Like if I if I want to run a style of fantasy that ha that is more um, more wuxia in influenced Oh wow! Okay. Old school D and D is not going to do anything for me. It's no. not going to. It's not going to help at all. I know some people might bring up. Anything. No. Um. And if I, I'm, I'm a big, fan, I'm a big fan of Legend of the Five Rings, mm. which is is Japan inspired, but it isn't trying to be historical Japan fantasy. Right. It instead is trying to be Rokugan, which. Takes some influences from Japan, China, Korea, the, Fi the Philippines, and so on. And I think I think cre I think creating s take when it comes to this whole thing of ch of chasing the of chasing the past a lot. I have gone through a lot of so of so called retro clones, and if yes. you were to go back and look at the games that I've reviewed, there's only Maybe two retro clones that I've reviewed: um, Adventure Conqueror King System and Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerers of Hyperborea. Both of them. I think are, I've played that one. The both of them are are taking are taking what came before and doing something new with it. Yes. Um, Adventure Conqueror King System, especially, and I'm not just saying that because I'm but because I'm buddies with Archon, but. It is doubling down on the on the end game concept by going with this idea that as you develop, 
you start to get more influence, start to get followers, eventually, and eventually a holding, which is why it has that name. But it isn't. Tr it isn't. Tr there's a lot of DNA of of um, AD and D in it, but it isn't trying to isn't trying to do some throwback to the way adventuring was supposed to be. And if you it's want, not trying to be smarter mm -hmm. than the player. And if you want a good success story of this whole of this whole building a bridge to Japan, mm. look at the way the independent wrestling scene has de has developed over the yes. last twenty years. Yes. Yep. Uh, especially the connection between um, the Japanese wrestling circuit and the WWE drafting no, circuit. I'm not. I'm not referring to Junior Land. I'm specifically referring to the f the earliest example of this is the fact that Ring of Honor was very much trying to do elements of the, of the style that was that was really breaking ground in st in stuff like All Japan and Noah King's Road, although doing it doing it in a bit of in a bit of a safer manner. Mm -hmm. Um, and. Because of that, you had a you had a lot of you had a lot of cross pollination where you had people going to to Japan and the states and and back. Um, so the re and a lot of um, a lot of Japanese promotions will have will have their working relationship where they'll send they'll send um, younger talent to to work outside of Japan and then eventually come back. Um, the big example of this, of course, is the Young Lion system. Yes. You work you work in black trunks for a while. You work in black trunks doing simple stuff for a while, then then you get sent over to say Ring of Honor or um, or CMLL or Revolution Pro to de to develop, and then you come back with a di with a different character. Um, that's yeah, and and the Japanese also import a lot of Americans into that. I, I'm <laughs> as embarrassing as it is. I am more of a fan of the women's wrestling in Japan, and I see a lot of uh, female American wrestlers come over there. So, yeah, and that that's that's cer that's cer that's certainly nothing new, especially especially promotions like Stardom. Who, yes, I, I that's my favorite. Um, the, who I'd say has largely recovered from that from the Yoshiko incident, which yeah. is which even to this day is hard to watch. But I do remember I do remember somebody asking why why doesn't New Japan have a women's division? And the answer is it's a, the answer is women's wrestling is a whole different culture. That's the reason j the term Joshi is used, especially in Japan. It, not only is it different here in the United States, but it's almost a different world in Japan. It's it's a cross between idol and wrestling and also like pop star at the same time. Yeah, and that's that's the reason why a, you're never you're not going to see a women's division in New Japan or no, or Noah or or All Japan or Wrestle One or or Hustle or King's Road. Um, King's Road isn't a promotion that was that was the that was the style that All Japan and Noah had. My bad. Much much like how New Japan had strong style. Hmm. But. Well, see, that's to to bring it back over to to Razor Fist and his comment. I remember what I was going to say. I'm sorry. This mm -hmm. it's just there's superheroes have really metamorphosized even in the years since I've been away from the monastery. They've really kind of altered. Mm -hmm. And so when Razor Fist brought that up about about pulp and 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 to be the answer to sort of the uh, straight laced uh, brush your teeth, go to school every day superhero, I thought. Um, what would be an interesting way to to bring back a, a pulp hero, but not uh, not to sort of copy and paste what you what existed before, like you said, the dogma of the past. Some people have and, done the man out of time thing, but yep. we've do, we've done we've been doing that to death for decades. Exactly. So I asked myself, I was like, what would be a great way for the government to subtly brainwash a super powered child? Because you're not going to get him to sit in a government facility. You saw what happened with Homelander. You're not going to get him to sit in a government facility. You're not going to get him even 10 miles underground. That's not going to work. So I said, well, why, don't, why wouldn't they create a superhero? Why wouldn't they create a superhero and get this kid interested in that to set up a role model? 
So that's where I came up with the character Star Magneon. And that was Star Supreme's hero growing up. As a child, she read manga from Japan. It was part of a Cold War effort mm. called Star Magneon. And you read in Star Supreme's bio on the, the Kickstarter that uh, she was handled by a government organization called Clash. In my setting, that's called the Commission for Law-Abiding Superhumans. And it's effectively a shield and Cadmus at the same time. And what they did with that is they created a figure for Star Supreme to model herself after, to learn morality and action from. Mm -hmm. And what I shaped Star Magneon after was, what if Indiana Jones was also a common writer? Now are we talking Showa or Heisei common writer? I'm I'm thinking Heisei because I liked Fives and I'm really basing Star Magneon sort of uh, motif off of Fives phase, if you will. Fives, remember, remember all of them were based on Greek letters. Yeah, and that's that's why he's traveling the world. It's kind of like the the Stargate situation where you have to collect these things, and that's how his his transformation device works. And they're, they're sort of uh, keys to power the way they were in Common Rider build. If they fell in the wrong hands, they could end the world. And that's the sub-story that Star Supreme is fed propaganda about America and fed propaganda about proper morality on the global stage. And propaganda is, is, a, is, a dirty, is treated as a dirty word, but I think... I think it's important. To, I think it's important to note that even that it's le that it's less of of her, of her being brainwashed into this kind of thing and more of um, guidance. Right. Because I say I say brainwash. I say propaganda because these are instruments of the government. Mm -hmm. They're not holding her eyes eyelids open, uh, Clockwork Orange style. That's mm -hmm. that's not what's happening with her. Is that. This is, this is a method of controlling her perception of the world, essentially. Uh, the way a parent would by censoring the information a child takes in. It's just more nefarious because the government's behind it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> now, t with, all that, with all that in mind, I do want to give my congratulations on, on getting well past your initial goal, because you're only asking for 700 and you're getting close to 2,000. And you yes. still got plenty of time to go. Um, yes. What are you shooting for as far as a release window for the book in digital form? I know um, shipping is always a crapshoot. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, as soon as the campaign closes, uh, the colorist is lined up to finish the last few pages of this. There's only six pages remaining to be colored. Mm -hmm. So inside of probably the early part of October, if not the late part of September, everything should be... Um, in your email, it's just the mailbox will take a little longer because of snail mail. Mm -hmm. Snail being the operative word here, but yes, I certainly, I certainly would be looking forward to see, to seeing what comes. Um, but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way back up to the temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here again, and just like last time, the, the view's wonderful from here. I, it's great coming up here and having these discussions, especially. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often s say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Smart rule. Rule zero, right? <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra I am your gaming monk stay fucking frosty everybody